Welcome to the Norwegian Embassy. It's great to have you here. It's an honor uh, hosting you here tonight, and especially the OSS uh, Society. Uh, I learned some weeks ago that uh, OSS Society, that's the sort of, uh, what do you call that? That was the origi origin of the CIA uh, and the special uh, forces. And uh, you all know that uh, the relationship between Norway and the United States is very, very strong. But one of the pillars in that relationship is really the cooperation between the intelligence services and our military forces. We stay shoulder to shoulder in Afghanistan, and we do that in Iraq, and we did that in the past also in the Western Balkans, and we will continue to do that. I would say uh, that the relationship between our militaries are indeed the sort of the, 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 the backbone of the relationships between our two countries. So that's why I'm so honored to have you here today. I also, before General Petraeus, before he left, I told him and his wife that when I served uh, as the Norwegian ambassador to Afghanistan uh, back in 2008 to 2010, then I really learned, good evening, sir, then I really learned uh, the value of what Norwegian soldiers are doing in international operations, and I really also learned how the military and the civilians are working together for the good. And that is something, uh, I, 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 I met a lot of friends there in Afghanistan, they continue to be my friends, but I will also say that being, serving here in the United States and being together with US soldiers, uh, US uh, officers, is really one of the sort of the most important things I'm doing in this country. And that, that, that's why I'm so happy to have you and so pleased to have you here tonight. This is not going to be a 45 minute speech. I will now hand over the floor to, to Charles Prince. So Charles, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, I, I am gonna give a 45 minute speech. <laughs> Ambassador Oss and distinguished guests, I'm honored to pay tribute to the close alliance between the United States and Norway. In 1940, following the invasion of Norway by Nazi Germany, Princess Martha and her children came to the United States at the invitation of President Roosevelt, who gave a speech in April of that year praising the Norwegian resistance. Two years later, the United States gave Norway a subchaser christened the King Håkon VII, with Princess Margaret's Martha, I'm sorry, standing by his side at the Washington Navy Yard. President Roosevelt said, if there's anyone who still wonders why this war is being fought, let him look to Norway. If there's anyone who has any delusions that this war could have been averted, let him look to Norway. And if there's anyone who doubts the democratic will to win, again I say, let him look to Norway. And President Roosevelt delivered that speech a little bit better than I did. <laughs> Thank you. His speech served as an important source of inspiration to Norwegians fighting the German occupation and for resistance fighters throughout Europe. After the war, the Norwegian government built a statue of FDR in Oslo to recognize his support. Only a few months earlier, in June 1942, President Roosevelt created the Office of Strategic Services, the World War II predecessor to the CIA and the U.S. Special Operations Command. One of its primary objectives was to help occupied countries free themselves from Nazi tyranny. When one half of the Norwegian fishing boats that were used to transport agents from the Shetland Islands uh, to Norway were sunk, the OSS procured three 110-foot subchasers to replace them. They carried out 114 missions to Norway with no casualties. The 801st, the 801st 492nd Bombardment Group, the legendary carpetbaggers, flew clandestine missions into Norway, delivering supplies to the Norwegian resistance. And I'd like to thank the government of Norway for presenting its surviving members with the Norwegian Commemorative Medal earlier this month. On March 24, 1945, the OSS undertook Operation Ripa, that consisted of 35 men from its Norwegian Special Operations Group. Its purpose was to cut the Nordland Rail Line at two points in the North Trotelog area. I hope I pronounced that correctly, did I? Okay. Close enough? Okay. <laughs> to prevent the Germans from redeploying 150,000 troops, two plane crashes resulted in the deaths of 10 OSS personnel. Facing the most adverse conditions imaginable, and with the help of the Norwegian resistance, they destroyed an 18-foot railway bridge at Tongan, 
Okay, okay. thank you. And two and one half kilometers of a rail line at Luridal. The two operations reduced the German rate of troop movement from one battalion a day to one battalion a month. And this mission was led by Major William Colby, who received a Silver Star and the St. Olaf's Medal for his bravery, and we're honored to have so many members of the Colby family here tonight. To commemorate this mission and the strong alliance between Norway and the United States, Operation REPA is inscribed on the Congressional Gold Medal, Congress's highest civilian honor that was awarded to the OSS earlier this year. And Ambassador Oz, it's my honor to present a replica of this medal to the Embassy of Norway on behalf of the OSS Society. If you haven't had a chance to see it, it's just outside the, uh, the room here. I had the honor of attending a dinner in Oslo earlier this year honoring one of the greatest heroes of the Norwegian resistance, Gunnar Sonstebe, and I had the great honor of sitting next to another hero of the resistance, Erling Lorentzen, who knew OSS founder, General William Donovan. When I returned to the United States, I wrote an op-ed about my trip that was inspired by President Roosevelt's Look to Norway speech. And I wrote that, quote, Western democracies are under assault as they were during World War II. Norway is once again leading the resistance. FDR's words are as relevant today as they were when he spoke them in 1942. And it's now my honor to introduce William Colby's son, Jonathan Colby. Thank you. I thought I could do no better than read from this after action report that my father wrote after the war. Uh, it's called OSS Operations in Norway, Skis and Daggers. <laughs> and I'll do, I'll, this will not be long, I promise you. Uh, the eight planes, as Charles suggested, the eight planes took off from eastern England, refueled in northern Scotland, and then went off over the, over the North Sea. And uh, <clears throat> the eight planes continued north across the North Sea over the Stark Fjords and the White Mountains, then up the Norway-Sweden coast, Trondheim, Namsos, almost to the Arctic Circle. By night, night had fallen, the moon was coming up. Below, a faint mist was appearing before the, uh, the sharpness of the rocks, but meaning, meaning trouble later. Then it was midnight, and the pilot called to say they were 25 miles off course over neutral Sweden. I told the men, and they began to buckle up with their white equipment. The pilot veered left and angled northward. Again, now I could see the shape of uh, the shape forest demonstrating the two countries. This is it, I said, told the pilot. Paulson and Anderson, naturally, <laughs> pulled up the, the door, and I went through the, into the awful quiet that comes in when the engines recede. Then there was the cold and the wonder if there was any friends below. And above, dimly, I, was, I counted the others jumping, slipping into the air. Once again, one, two, three. Formation, perfect, five seconds apart. Then my chute opened, and now, and now the others. At 500 feet, the underground's landing <coughs> fires pierced the haze, and with them came the sure knowledge that we were at the rendezvous. Step one had been gone according to plan, but it was the last thing to go right until the end of the Nordland Railway. <laughs> <laughs> Such was the beginning of Operation Ripe. And as Charles mentioned, there were 150,000 German troops who had been pushed out of Finland by the Red Army, and they were congregated in northern Norway. And clearly the Battle of the Bulge had just happened in, uh, in Belgium and, and, and involving around and Eastern, uh, Western Germany. And so these soldiers were a real threat and they were trying to get home, as Charles had suggested, on this Nordland Railway. So the mission of, of the OSS was originally to grab the railway cowboy style, Jesse James, as my father says in the report, and just grab the train, fill it with explosives and just blow up bridges and tunnels all along the way. Well, that proved a little impossible with all the Germans along. <laughs> so instead they went by ski through some formidable temperature uh, these women were made up an, amaz an, an unusual group of Americans. However, their names read like heroes from some Norse saga, Olsen, Johansson, Iverson, Eliasen, Ostlan, and indeed they were, but the bulk of them had been stranded off Norwegian ships in the early days of the war and were one way or another in recruited into the U.S. Army. <clears throat> so the first cold night, it was, uh, the fir their, their first bitter cold night, it was 20 below, 1,950 miles south of the Arctic Circle, we spent gathering the packages that had dropped out of the plane and hauling them under trees and under snow. This was vital for the arrival of eight motored planes in a normally inactive sector of that part of Norway, and even drawing attention, uh, even without dropping any explosives, they were certain to bring out German observation planes, as <laughs> the general and I were discussing, uh, followed by possible loss of security or even worse. Uh, we needed, we had. So then they went on to the, the bridge at, uh, at, their first target was the bridge at Grand, our primary objective, 
and orders were to avoid contact, un, unequal contact with the enemy. Also because uh, Easter was nearing a time when Norwegians, Quislings, national, Quislings included, traditionally appear in the hills for the winter sports. We sunk into the woods, gathered firewood by, the, by, by day, hugged trees by, hugged, hugged, hugged fires by night when smoke was invisible, waiting to hear that the others were coming. And then, of course, the planes didn't come. They were, they, one of them crashed, as Charles mentioned, in the, in the Orkneys. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and. So anyway, onto the, onto the bridge. Uh, Easter had passed by now. That day we moved in, they moved into a hut. The owner and his wife, two children, his 70-year-old mother <laughs> and 75-year-old father shaped up, uh, strapped up their light Norwegian skis and sped off on their 40-mile hike in the country off to Sweden to escape so the OSS boys could have their house. So oh. thank you <laughs> to the mothers of South Norway. <laughs> One must, uh, our usual luck was with us, and three hours after setting out, we were plodding into a sleet storm carried by the strong west wind and turning our clothing, equipment, and the snow covered into a sheet of ice, making it almost impossible for the skis to take hold. Then we went on, the next day we went 25 miles further. Finally, we got to the, <clears throat> the peaks overlooking the Tangen Bridge. This was the secondary target, the Tangen Bridge, where the railroad skis, Ottingen Lake, Ottingen Lake, up, up north there. Uh, picture the Hudson River, for the Americans here, picture the Hudson River, the old man writes, visualizing the Palisades three times their true height. Place a railroad snug against the foot of the cliffs and then uh, crest the whole thing with four feet of snow and six inches of wet ice. Now please, now then place 23 skiers along the top of the mountain and they're carrying revolvers, Tommy guns, grenades, friends, and 180 pounds of TNT and other equipment. So how the, the trick was how to get to the bottom of the hill. Well, this, uh, Mr. Helgeson, the leader of the Resistance Norway with whom they worked, he said it was impossible to get down. But the old man said, well, you don't have to ski. You just sit down on the skis. So that's how they got down. They went bumping down. They went bumping down. <laughs> they went bumping down. <coughs> it's difficult to blow. And, and uh, one of the, the officers, uh, Sergeant Milan, Colonel Corporal K. Johansson and Sergeant Orky Anderson, set the charges under the long uh, eye-girded bridge. They planted all we had, enough to blow the bridge up four times, just in case. It's difficult to blow up steel. Most of it simply bends out of shape. But the, the second Farnsworth touched the wires, he was the, uh, the uh, bombardier, touched the wires and the TNT went off. The structure vanished. The noise was awful, rocking back and forth between the hills. Even the softening, the softening lake seemed to, to hum, jump. And it did crack with a boom in, like distant thunder. The happy men stood around with smiles on their grimy, weary faces. At last they had done something, and the Northern Railway was stopped. So at the very end of it, at the very end of the war, so that after that, the Germans were after them, so they had to run like hell. And the, they began to recruit a lot of Norwegian resistance fighters came to join them because they saw the end of the war was coming. And so they ended up outside Trondheim, and the last duty that the old man had, which he was very proud of, and there's a picture in that material that I left behind, uh, as he says, the rest of the story is routine, routine for him anyway. <laughs> we supervised the surrender and policed 10,000 Germans at Namsos, and we acted as an honor guard for Crown Prince Olaf on his return to Trondheim and accompanied him in the parade to, in his honor on 10th of June. just have uh, two comments uh, and uh, two pieces of information. The first piece of information is that during the Second World War, the king's family, they lived in this building. Wow. Okay, so his wife and the three children, they lived here. So if, when, you, when, when you're leaving, uh, we have a library downstairs and there you see the sort of the uh, skateboard desk, desk uh, which, they, uh, which they used. The second piece of information is that uh, John here referred to Wittgen Quisling. Wittgen Quisling was a trade thrown already during the Second World War. And uh, 
he had a carpet, and the carpet is in that room, in the dining room, in the living room. And the reason why the, the, the carpet is there is a huge Persian carpet. You should, you, should, you should have a look at it. The reason why it's here is that it's because the, the, the Norwegian government, after the Second World War, uh, World War, they decided that the carpet should be in Washington D.C. So most, so a lot of allies could stamp or work on the carpet. <laughs> so, normally, I have my guests jumping on the carpet. We are not doing that that uh, tonight. Uh, but once again, thank you for coming. Great to have you here and enjoy the evening. Thank you. Thank you.